will, will be rec will be recorded. Oh, yeah. there we go. So, are we recording now? Then maybe it's being recorded now. Great. So, welcome everybody um, to the penultimate of uh, this new showcase series, which I think we were saying before we thought it's been quite successful. Thank you all for supporting it. See lots of uh, familiar faces. People have come along every week. What we have this week is uh, our colleague from social work, Dr. Denise Turner. Now she's uh, she came to us from um, Sussex. She uh, has a PhD. She's researched a number of areas, but she's going to talk to us particularly today about one of her major areas of research, which essentially is grief and loss. And mm -hmm. she's talking about it in the context of uh, a pandemic, which of course is so relevant and so apt as I am you know, extremely grateful to have her here. Now, Denise has worked professionally as a social worker. She's a qualified social worker, worked in a number of what I would call professional settings, as well as in academia, and uh, has a number of accolades in research, very, very much into in, uh, internet and technological uh, enabling, and also, of course, has a number of teaching awards in uh, in, her, in in her previous time, and, and students seem to like her teaching here as well. So there you go. Anyway, so so really an all rounder of the, the type we should celebrate. So without further ado, we'll we'll give. Denise, the floor for her talks. As I say, stack up the questions in the chat. Uh, raise hands towards the end. And welcome, Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So um, I just need to get my slides on. There we go. Can you see that? Can everybody see that? That's very good for me. Okay, marvellous. So thank you very much, Don. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, don't know how to follow that really, um, but I'll, I'll do it by starting my session. So um, as Don said, uh, my name is Denise Turner. I'm a senior lecturer in social work um, and I'm delighted to uh, be here today. And thank you for everybody for coming to listen and for Don for asking. Um, so hopefully we can have a bit of a discussion as as Don said but I'm I'm going to um tell you a little bit about my research and uh the brief was to talk a bit about current research um but also in in the light of covid so uh that's that's what I'm going to aim to do So here's one of those this presentation slides um, what I'm aiming to do is tell you a little bit about my research, uh, the background to it, and then how that's connected to the developments that have come up as we're living through this extraordinary time. And I want to look a little bit about the overlaps between loss. I think it's fair to say that, that we've all been experiencing different forms of loss at the moment. So um, I want to look at the, the overlaps between that and bereavement. And I'm going to focus on four projects and their associated outputs that um, and linking those to impact and to public engagement from my research work. And then just think for about a nanosecond about the future and, and where we all move to this pandemic, whenever that will be. So I hope that will be OK. OK. Oops, my laptop, I was just saying to Mava, is a little bit sticky today. So you're going to have to bear with me. Um, one of the things that I thought about before I, when I was planning this session is that um, I went to Diane Smith's very interesting presentation quite uh, recently when she was talking about um, impact. And it, it led me to think, well, what is the point of research? What, what is the point of research for me? And as Don said, I'm a, I'm a social worker. I'm, um, I work for years in different settings as a social worker. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a helper. And um, so my research is very applied and I want it to be able to make a difference um, in, in the public sphere. So, some of what I'm going to talk about today is around public engagement. And you can see here the second definition is, is very much about uh, activities research that brings the public and researchers together. 
that, that changes things and that can be through all sorts of different ways and hopefully um, that's some of what I'm going to talk about today, how my research has led to those different forms of public engagement. So just a bit of context, um, my PhD originally about six, seven years ago now, uh, there it is, it was called Telling the Story and it was about what happens to parents when they have a child die suddenly and unexpectedly. I always think when I say that there's there's no easy way of 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 sort of saying that topic. It's always a difficult and um, you know the dread is always at parties when I was doing it. People would say, "What's your PhD about?" And I think, "Oh no, <laughs> here we go. I'm I'm going to have to talk about this because I think it's fair to say that that child death still in our society is is quite taboo. Actually, it's a very difficult thing for people to talk about. So, and when a child dies un unexpectedly, um, parents are always interviewed by the police and they are always treated as guilty until proven innocent. It's, it's a reverse of the normal um, way of things. So, so my PhD looked at that experience, what that was like for parents. And what it led to was a real interest in actually what is it like for professionals? You know, I'm a practitioner. Um, I teach on a professional course. So actually, what what training, what support do professionals get when they're having to investigate something that is so difficult? And that's still an interest of mine. Um, and the answer is they don't get much. And it's probably also me saying that actually, because uh, Don's touched on it, the um, the other strand to my research, I've always had two fairly disparate strands. Um, one has been this interest in death and dying, um, and the other one has been in digital practices. And traditionally, although my PhD is about um, an aspect of bereavement and death, I've always traditionally found it quite difficult um, to get published on that and also um, to get interest in it. Um, and still COVID, when actually um, the, the two sort of disparate strands of my research um, came alive really all of a sudden what what everybody seemed to be interested in digital practices because everybody's moving online all of a sudden you know the online world became our world and also um, simply just an interest in bereavement because that's what we have been seeing so I've never in my life had so many invitations to review for journals and um, all of a sudden these articles and things came pouring in and there's been a real interest in in both uh, disparate aspects of my research. So, but um, it's the bereavement bit that I'm focusing on today. So I have a book, um, a, a very expensive book that, that came out of my PhD, published with um, Paul Grave, which uh, is very much around this um, parents' experiences of unexpected child death. I also just wanted to say that I've got an upcoming book, actually, um, Social Work and COVID-19 which is coming out with critical publishing in 2020. That's the plug. Um, but the important bit about that is that um, some of the, I'm an editor for this book, and some of the contributors to the chapters uh, are three of our students in social work who are uh, collaborating on a chapter together. Somebody who, who works on our program as a service user in social work, and we've also got our local authority partners writing a chapter as well so it's a, a very applied and um, I hope will be a useful book and um, I'm also I've got various publications um, on this kind of aspects of bereavement this one I've put here is in press with a journal called qualitative social work and it's talking about the significance of bereavement for social work students I've put that up there because some of those social work students were our students at London Met, so it was a it was a collaborative piece of research, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a bit. So I wanted to talk a little bit. Sorry to put Boris Johnson up. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the conflation between loss and death 
Um, and that's it's it's I'll I'll come on and talk about this a little bit again in a minute. But um, it's it's a very English thing, I think that um, in England we we quite often substitute the word death with the word loss. So loss is another strand to my research and something that I'm interested in. And, you know, this is Johnson's speech on the 12th of March, where he said many families in Britain will lose loved ones before their time. Um, and what he actually meant, of course, was that a lot of people would die um, and a lot of people have died. And you know, I think that's quite interesting because it's a way of uh, maybe denying that reality, but also certainly softening it. Um, loss, loss and death are, are, are not the same thing. And, you know, that's something that, that I'll talk about a bit today. And just to sort of drive that point home, um, here's the dictionary definitions. Loss to lose means that you no longer have something because you don't know where it is. Um, and death, as the Cambridge Dictionary um, so succinctly puts it, is the end of life. And I like to think that, that these forms of, of loss can be thought of as primary and secondary losses. And throughout our lives, we're actually rehearsing for death and bereavement in, in various ways. We, you know, to be born at all, arguably, is a loss. Um, and then we go on encountering small losses throughout our, our lives. And of course, throughout the pandemic, we've encountered all of us in different ways, major or, or maybe perhaps more minor losses. So, um, so that's just something to think about and to bear in mind as I go on talking. One thing people in, in England is we don't like talking about death very much. Um, and I think that's context for the research that I'm going to talk about. So national survey, I think this was in the blurb for my talk, um, a national survey, really big survey about two years ago showed that 18 million people nationwide were very uncomfortable talking about death. Um, and the survey called it a, a major taboo. Five million people also said that they wouldn't talk about their own death. So where there can be talk of advanced planning of talking to your loved ones about your wishes that becomes very difficult actually when when we can't talk to our loved ones about our deaths and of course you know, this figure here the 44,000 and rising um has risen even further i think there's something like 65,000 um deaths now is 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 one of the calculated totals so we're facing as we all know we're facing that on to use that much used word an unprecedented scale for for contemporary times in a society that doesn't like to talk about death uh, this is another survey another 2018 survey where um it, it was a survey conducted by the royal college of physicians um, where they, they talk to doctors and to medics. The, the survey is called Talking About Dying, um, and you can see how to begin honest conversations about what lies ahead. What they found in the survey is that doctors didn't like talking to people about dying. So it's not just the public or the sort of wider society where death can be taboo, it's also um, doctors. Quite often, medics will see death as a failure. Uh, they're not trained for people to die. So that's that's very much the context for COVID. And then I wanted to think a little bit again, I've already touched on loss. Uh, when I was training to be a social worker, which is hundreds of years ago now, many more years ago than I like to think about, um, one of the core texts actually was Peter Maris's Loss and Change. And he talked about grief as a concept that that applied to lots and lots of different experiences that we have in life. And I just picked this quotation out because I thought it, um, it really sums up actually a, a lot of what everybody's been through in the past few months, where he says that our purposes and expectations come to be organized around particular relationships. And these are crucial to the way we constitute the meanings of our lives. And uh, many of us in whatever way have lost those particular relationships those work relationships people we might see on the train or on the commute you know we've we've had to um to change the way that we're living and so that that in itself is a loss um second uh quotation is is from goffman 
uh, Goffman talking about death, where he says um, that actually, from the minute we're born, basically, our time is ticking away. But actually, we don't think about that. We we only hold our breath for seconds and minutes of it. So I think what COVID has, has given us, uh, whether we like it or not, is is an opportunity to think about those losses. Um, and, and that can be difficult for all sorts of reasons. It might be useful and you know if you want to put it in the chat or whatever or just to think about it for yourself as well it might be useful to think about what losses that you think you have experienced during this time um, i made a little list um and i'm i think of these as i've said previously i think of these as secondary losses so the the primary loss being the mortality and death the secondary losses being um not minor losses because they may be major losses to us um, but certainly secondary losses so i think obviously the lockdown itself we've had social distancing we've had um a lack of rituals and funerals where people haven't been able to carry out the things that they normally would in terms of um saying goodbye to loved ones that have died i'll move on and talk about that again in a bit work um I live with two quite young people who are thinking about the next chapters in their lives and I think that it's been difficult for them. They don't know if there's going to be any jobs. They don't know what to expect in the next few years. So there's been a loss of that kind of um, taken for granted future, I think. So having sort of thought about all that as a form of context, I wanted to just move on to um, these are four projects and they're all linked in different ways to COVID-19. The first project is, is one which I've already touched on, where we looked at bereavement experiences amongst social work students. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that in a minute. The second piece of work is, is a bit of work that I did with the Northern Irish government, um, who'd seen some of the work that I'd done on loss and bereavement and, and approached me to do that. Then there's a, co a collective event that, that I um, help with, uh, with the care home sector. And then just briefly, I'm going to touch on some research that, that I'm doing moving forward. I want to focus a little bit on this project. This is um, exploring the significance of bereavement amongst social work students and newly qualified practitioners. Um, we were funded to do this. Uh, by London Met Ref Money starting in 2018 and it was a, a collaboration this project with the University of Chichester and um, we wanted to do it because there's been a lot of focus on the mental health of students loads of kind of attention paid to that but what we couldn't find was actually anything that had focused specifically on the link between bereavement and social work students and you may think, well, why does that matter? Why is that important? Um, and one of the reasons that it is, is because quite often people are attracted to things like social work because they've had traumas in their lives. Sometimes those traumas are unresolved and it makes it harder to be a helper when you may still be needing quite a lot of help yourself. So, um, and also in my previous research that drawing from my PhD, as I've said, I looked at parents' experiences, um, but what I found in the research was actually there was almost no training and support for practitioners who were then called into what were very often highly traumatic circumstances with actually no real training advice and guidance for that. So I became very interested in how do we support those people that have to face those kind of events. So we looked at, um, we looked at uh, this uh, experience of bereavement. Um, and as I've said, we did it with the University of Chichester. Um, Chichester have a very, very different demographic from London Met. Most of their students, social work students are young. They're in the kind of 18 to 25 group. And most of their students are from white British backgrounds. So um, a very, very kind of different, different population from London Met. We put out a call for, for contributors. It's a very small 
scale piece of qualitative research this and we we got um 12 contributors most of the participants came from london met um which i think is significant now and i've just put these research questions up we 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 used a methodology where we um it's what's called an open narrative methodology so just ask people a question you know kind of why why did you want to take part in this research today what have you got to tell us and and the idea is that people then tell you their story which did happen in and it's the same methodology that i've used previously so um i'm really happy to answer questions about this if anybody wants to know any more about it because i'm i'm realizing i've got to move through all this fairly swiftly we found we we um, came up with four common themes through thematic analysis and and these are the labels that we gave. so one of them was very much around practicality students saying they didn't have the time um, or the money actually money was a huge thing um, particularly for London Met students who were often experiencing bereavements that were a long way away um, there was also something about support that actually people weren't getting this goes back to what I was talking about before about death being quite a taboo subject people weren't getting the support um, and one of the students told me this story where a service user that they'd been working with had died over the weekend and they'd come back into their their work placement um, and been quite up to find that this person had died and their um, the, their practice educator, the person that was responsible for their placement, said to them, um, you just have to learn to be more resilient about death, uh, which is really interesting because what that, what that says to me is that they weren't getting the support either, <laughs> actually. So it's kind of, um, oh, I can't deal with this. Please be resilient because I don't think I can deal with it. Culture um, and cultural differences was probably the major finding from this research and um, I'll move on and talk about that separately in a minute and then finally it's kind of not a new finding it's linked to other research but we found that all losses are linked to other losses so if there is a bereavement the, the chances are that a previous loss will come up um, as well I wanted to focus just a little bit on um, the cultural aspect I think when we came into this research, we didn't, we weren't aware actually of the power of what we were going to find. We were aware that there didn't seem to be much on bereavement and social work specifically. Um, what we found is that there is almost no work at all on, um, this is a quote from somebody else from Lawson. She, she describes grief as you can see as a, a epistemological site for interrogating the detrimental impacts of race and social inequality that's something that we've seen come up during covid you know that message that we're all in this together is not true and and we know that now you know um covid has affected many communities in in a far more detrimental way than it has others so what we found from this research is that is that um there is enormous amounts of work i think on um looking at bereavement as a site of kind of racial and social inequality we follow a very western model in in this country sort of funerals um rituals the way that we grieve is is dominated by a western model and i've just put up there as an example that actually there's been very little there's been quite a bit in the press about um rituals under covid um you know the ways that that people haven't been able to to gather together there's been very very little actually on the impact of certain communities um for example the muslim community and i've written a little bit about that that's what that link is so um i'm aware this is a bit of a whistle stop tour but i'll carry on um because of that work on culture, when, when COVID uh, came upon us, uh, I was contacted by the Chief Social Worker for Northern Ireland, Sean Holland, um, through a colleague of mine at Queen's University, Belfast. And Sean very specifically wanted to do something. He wanted to provide a marker um, around the ways that COVID was affecting death rituals for people in Northern Ireland. Um, and traditionally, without sort of generalizing too much, um, 
Northern Irish people will have particular rituals that that are very different from kind of those more kind of uptight, stiff upper lip kind of English rituals. And Sean was worried about that the effect that COVID would have on these rituals. So he asked us to do, um, myself and my colleague Amanda Taylor Bezik, who's at Queen University, he asked us just to do a bit of work around this. And the first thing that we did was a blog with the Social Care Institute for Excellence. We put the blog up and, and what we did is we asked for contributions. So we asked for comments from the people of Northern Ireland. What were they experiencing around um, what, what had happened to them? And the comments, as you might expect, they reflected quite deep trauma, but um, there were also a lot of concerns, again, about cultural appropriation. Um, so very much sort of thinking back to, to the last slide, somebody wrote in the comments, I've noticed the language has changed in recent years. People have talked about the person who's passed rather than died. And people were worried about this. Um, they felt that somehow, um, now that if you like bereavement had <laughs> gone into the mainstream that somehow that was starting to erode their own particular traditions and rituals and so sort of thinking about that just really slightly from a theoretical perspective um, lots of you will be familiar with kubler ross's stage theory um, there are some more contemporary theories which talk about um, and this very much resonates with the the research i did with chichester we don't ever achieve acceptance, actually. When we have a loss or a bereavement, it becomes part of who we are. And um, Neymar, who's an American the theorist, also said that, that one of the things that we have to achieve when we've experienced any significant form of uh, loss or bereavement, and, and I would argue that we all have under COVID in, in some sort of way, one of, the, one of the tasks for all of us is to achieve meaning making. So um, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about how we tried to um, make some meaning out of this experience with the care home sector. But just before that, some of you will have come across this concept of disenfranchised grief. This is Kenneth Doker, um, who's another American. Um, and what Doker was talking about when he talked about disenfranchised grief was um, people who are deprived of the rituals and the shared catharsis of of that of sharing grief together so i think again that's something that we can all resonate with in some kind of way um, during the past few months and what's happened i put this up collaborate doesn't like animation um, it, it should it should be split up but it's a really good way i think of of showing um how grief theory is never, you know, they're, they're, it, it, grief isn't like that, basically. So the one on the left is a kind of stage theory. It's here's what grief looks like. You go through all these different stages. Um, and the one on the right is, as you can see, my experience. And that's that's much more, I think, what, what grieving looks like to people. It's, it's personal. It's often messy. It goes backwards and forwards. Um, and I think, you know, that's something that that will be resonating for a long time, actually, even as people talk about going back to normal. So thinking about that uh, concept of meaning making and sort of collective um, collectivizing to try and avoid disenfranchised grief. Um, and again, it's it's a sort of a movement through this, if you like, that the, the blog and the work that we did with Northern Ireland government, um, somebody from the care home sector saw this work and got in touch with me. Um, and she comes from an organization called the National Association of Activity Providers. She wanted to do something with the care home sector. And again, lots of you will be really aware of how that sector has been very, very heavily hit under COVID. She wanted to do something that recognized that and um, the impact on this sector. So that's going right back to my sort of original slide about impact and engagement. How do we make that from our work? She'd seen my work and she'd approached me and said, can you help us to do something? Um, so what we did is in a week, actually, I'm quite proud of this. <laughs> in a week, we put together something called Stars in Memory. Um, and we, uh, interacted a lot we publicized it a lot on social media under this hashtag um, 
we got from a standing start we got over 30 partners from from social work and social care who joined us in this um i haven't put any of the stuff from social media up here because of gdpr but if you if you're on social media and you go onto this hashtag it's it's really quite breathtaking there's videos of people in care homes making their stars there's loads of photographs um i must admit i really teared up um so we had the 30th of June, we designated it as Stars in Memory Day. And within a week, we had all these people, we had all these organizations working with us. So, um, and I think, you know, that's public engagement from, from my perspective. And here's just some um, photographs. I've got permission to use these. You can see that um, there were whole doorways with stars in them. Marie Curie joined in with this and they had whole corridors with stars. It was it was really quite breathtaking. And just before I finish, I'm just going to think a little bit about different forms of public engagement. Um, again, sort of thinking around that impact agenda, that public engagement agenda and moving back to thinking about death as a taboo, which I started with. Where do we learn that? You know, where does that come from? So I'm collaborating with some colleagues at Goldsmiths University. Um, they run as part of their research project, something called the Children's Photography Archive. It's the first ever archive of its kind um, where it features children photographers. And part of this research is to develop educational materials so that um, they can be used in primary schools. So I'm working with them on authoring a, a series of toolkits the first one being around children's experiences of death and dying and we've got student researchers a student researcher in social work who's helping us with that and who's going to be writing a piece with us on that so i've just included that again to think about engagement moving forwards um i'm working with uh the university of sussex global studies and the university of kingston geography slightly different um, angle on this, which is to think about um, loss in terms of what has happened to single parent families during COVID. Um, so that's something that is kind of emergent, um, but I've, I've included it because um, it's, you know, it's another form of loss in some sort of way. And I've just put these in just briefly before I finish. Um, just I was just thinking around other other forms of public engagement and and one of the things that I do is I'm associate editor for continuing professional development for the journal child abuse review we put out a call for papers as so many journals did um, during the pandemic um, we and it was a, a call for practitioner papers and we really had a huge flurry of um, papers written by practitioners who who we're really experiencing a lot of loss and a lot of stress, actually, um, and who wanted to share that. They, they'd had their professional lives turned upside down. Um, many of these papers are around um, domestic abuse, fears for what hap was happening to people, um, safeguarding where social workers could no longer go into the houses and see the children. Um, and again, you know, a real feeling that practitioners were looking for support and to have their voices heard. So um, if you have access to that journal, do look out for those papers because some of them are really fabulous. Um, and I suppose this is just kind of going back to where I started really. Um, I said at the beginning, and it's true that it, when I started off writing about uh, death and bereavement, um, it's a bit of a party pooping. Um, subject so it, it was quite difficult to get people to engage with it and and what I found through this is actually now people are really interested in it so this is just one example of that um, community care live which is a big event put on by the social work and social care sector in October um, have asked me to come and speak about death and bereavement to think around how social work managers can support their colleagues and service users and that's not really been done, you know, in contemporary practice, I think it's fair to say that hasn't been a priority, actually. So it's not it's not something that has been um, there at the hub of things. 
So I think that's that's a good thing because in my view, we're all dealing, all of social work is about loss and change. All of life is about loss and change. So, um, so I think if if this has helped us to think about that, then then that hopefully is is one sort of positive outcome from this pretty ghastly time. So, and this is my last slide. Many of you will, will know this. Um, this is from the go between. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, I put this in because there's a lot of conversation. I mean, uh, Boris Johnson said we're all going to be back to normal by Christmas, um, although that's heavily contested. My view is even if we were back to normal, um, that normal doesn't exist anymore. Um, it, it is, as is commonly said, a new normal um, and one that will look very different to the one that, that we were experiencing in February and, and, and one where I think we will have very different resonances with loss and change and bereavement. So that's something that I'm going to be thinking about as I move forward with my research. The references are there. Um, so just for me to say um, thank you very much for listening. If you do, if you do have any questions, do let me know. Thank you very much, Denise. I was just slowly turning myself on there. We have a question from Louise Ryan. Louise? She might be turning herself on. Yes, I was turning myself on. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah, anyway, your floor's all yours, Louise. Thank you. Thank you very much. That that was a really thought-provoking and, and very stimulating uh, presentation. Yes, I'm glad it made sense. Yes, <laughs> no, I, I, I won't say enjoy. Enjoy might be the wrong word, but I found it... <laughs> I found it very thought provoking, Denise. So I just wanted to, to pick up a couple of things. I mean, first of all, when you talked about loss and the idea of losing a parent, whenever anybody says that to me, I'm always reminded of the famous Oscar Wilde quote, which which is often kind of provokes in me a sort of inappropriate reaction because I feel like the handbag. laughing, you know, about losing one parent is, is misfortune, but losing two is, is a sign of carelessness. So I think you're right, that word loss can can actually um, trigger something different from perhaps what's intended. And I'm also struck by the word pass, which I've noticed has really been used a lot recently, but I don't remember it being used very much previously. So I don't know where exactly where it's come from, but these are all euphemisms for death, which, which again mm -hmm. goes back to your point about how uncomfortable we are to actually say death and, and dying and dead. But one of the things I wanted to pick up on was this construction of Western. And I don't know what Western means, because as you when you said Western, I was immediately thinking, well, it's very different in Ireland. Yeah. And, and then you went on to say precisely that. And of course, it's different again in Spain and Italy. And and I think we have to be very careful of setting up this idea that there is a Western way of doing death and mourning and bereavement, because there isn't really. So I would say it is much more culturally specific, even within the so-called West and even between Ireland and England, it does differ. And even within you know, parts of England, I think class as well as culture and religion really complicate how we do death and dying. And the other point I wanted to just mention very briefly was I've just finished um, or I'm just finishing work on a on a large ESRC project that we had at the University of Sheffield. I've just literally come in the last few weeks from the University of Sheffield to join London Met. And one, this this project was called Sustainable Care. And I was interviewing people in their 80s and 90s. And we were talking about care. And one of the things we were trying to get the people to talk about were their sort of care plans and the people we were interviewing were not in care homes that was one of our selection criteria and it was really fascinating to observe how unwilling people were to talk about care plans even people in their 80s and 90s they all said well it's too soon for me to think about that or i'm not mm. ready to think about that yet so it really made it clear to me that is that almost 
too late to start talking to people because it's too comfortable it's too uncomfortable it's too close to the bone and so at what point should we really start trying to talk to people about these very very uncomfortable issues i don't have the answers denise but it really struck a chord with me when <laughs> from my own experience that even people in their 80s and early 90s are saying I'm not ready to talk about those issues yet. I think thank you Louise that's that's absolutely fascinating and I you know we must <laughs> I suppose that's the point isn't it of some of these research sessions that actually I was thinking we must have a, a talk about this elsewhere because that's just led to all sorts of thoughts for me. The first thing about about um, Western you know, yes, I completely agree with you. I think um, I was aware that I'd sort of plonked an awful lot into this um, presentation and it's really complex. All of it is incredibly complex, as you've pointed out. So I think I have to hold my hand up there and say that, you know, you're right. I've, I've sort of, for convenience, if you like, um, I've used it, you know, I've tried to simplify it and and, you know, I hold my hand up to that one. I think that it is, enormously complicated and the more work I do in this area um, the more I realize that and and sometimes that makes me think oh you know it's it's too complicated but that also kind of keeps me going and keeps my interest the thing about care I think um, I am fascinated by um, the the and and as you've seen I started off working in this area through looking at sudden and unexpected death um, which is again a sort of it's it's like one of the inner Russian dolls if you like I think there is it's become and again without trying to sort of generalize or to or to simplify this it's it's become kind of okay to talk about death and dying if we're talking about advanced care planning um, that that's become something that people talk about a lot palliative care is something that people may talk you know that that may become a sort of acceptable face I think Sudden death is is very difficult still, um, but you know my I think my thoughts are that actually exactly resonate with exactly what you've said that actually it's in a context where people won't talk about death and dying, you know it's too simplistic to say you just need to have a conversation, you know you just need to sit down and have a conversation with your loved ones um, about what you want, what your wishes are because because that's that's in a context of it being incredibly difficult to talk about our deaths or the deaths of loved ones um and i think the last point wh where do we you know where do we learn this what do we do about it if you like i i don't know the answer either but i suspect that it lies with children and with education somewhere because the work that i've done with children and the the parents in my original thesis who talked about their children um, there was one woman that I interviewed, a mother that I interviewed when I was doing my PhD. Her her little boy had died and, and her, she still had a little boy who was about five. And I still remember her saying it to me. She said, children have led me through my grief. Um, it was such a powerful statement. And um, what she meant by that was that it, it was only the children who weren't afraid of it. So, uh, you know, I think for me, it lies there somehow. We we teach our children at some point to be afraid of it, I think. Um, does that answer your question, Louise? Oh, yes, th thanks. I mean, it's, it, as you say, it's a very complex issue. So I look forward to the opportunity to sit down with <laughs> you someday and have a coffee I, face to face. I, we might have such great. a thing. I, love doing that. I should just say to you as well that um, I mentioned the Childhood Publics Network that I'm working with who do the um, the photography archive and and um, the colleague that I'm working with she called the toolkit for death she called it the death toolkit and and I said to her oh I don't know about that <laughs> that seems a bit stark so you know when we talked about it I realized that I was doing exactly the same thing you know she said well it's the death toolkit that's what it is so um and I said yeah okay you're right it is but but even for me I thought gosh that sounds very you know almost confronting so yeah i think it's really complex and i'd love to talk to you about it thank you thank you denise and thank you louise we have a question from digby in the in the um in the chat 
is the change of discourse to speaking of people who have passed as in passed on perhaps a reflection of meaning making and continu continuing bonds where passing on may refer to moving into another dimension as opposed to finally uh, having died yes i think that's i think that's really interesting actually digby and i think it's it does I mean, Don and I were talking just at the beginning about, you know, how everything is joined together historically. And I know your keynote last week, Don, was very much around that as well. So, you know, many of the ways that we think and talk about death now, obviously, um, we will have inherited, you know, through some sort of historical um, loop. So I suspect some of that is to do with um, traditions you know around heaven and hell or afterlife or um and one of the things that i didn't talk about today but um that i'm very interested in is the ways in which technology is hoping to almost defeat the afterlife so there is a um a firm in i forget the name of them at the moment but they're in switzerland and um they're developing robots where as you're still alive you can uh, upload your personality into the robot and the robot when you die the robot will will act as you so um i think that there are ways in which we always use whatever historical period we are in to try and defeat death in some way because um and i suspect the language is reflected in that as you've said very, very good point, that Denise. Uh, uh, we have a question now from uh, Donna Yodan Gall. Donna, uh, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, thank you for that um, talk. Interesting, because my um, dissertation would be on sudden death. Um, but I'm looking at it from the perspective of siblings. Um, siblings. OK. Um, so, but I'm doing more of an IPA, um, looking at that. Um, and I listened also to the chat with Digby and talking about continuing bonds. And uh, mm. But I'm looking more at it as a relationship, a continued yeah. relationship that you would have. In my case, it's about that sibling. Um, because if, as you may well know, as you start talking about um, Doka and all of them, um, the movement stage into more of what Digby's talking about, continuing bonds and that meaning making and all of that, um, that whole historical aspect. Mm. What I and you're talking about culture is I am deliberately steering away from culture <laughs> um, because it's too, it's really too complicated um, yes. um, to discuss. That's like a whole post -op thesis everything in itself to to write yeah. um and it's it's and I, and I kept it to qualitative rather than anything else is to really just listen to their experiences of what it was like to lose someone mm -hmm. but a sibling specifically because it's yeah. a different relationship as you were talking about a mother to a child or a parent mm -hmm. to a child as mm -hmm. compared to siblings which when you were talking about disenfranchised grief um, they are a marginalized group so um, hence uh, my writing about them mm. um, and I, I am finding it very difficult in how to maybe simplify the discussion in my thesis because it is as you said very complex and you could bring in so many different things into that um, and I don't know how you went about yours in the sense of making it easy for maybe as a reader who doesn't know anything about this. Okay. Um, journey um, with that person and the literature in, a, in marrying that impact mm -hmm. as you're talking about and that academic aspect to it as well. What well, again, I think. You no, know, I think I, that's probably something that we ought to touch base with together. I'm really happy to talk to you about that. I think, um, you, as you said, my, my PhD looked at, at parents' experiences. Of course, what came up through the parents' experiences was the sibling experience. Mm -hmm. So parents, there's quite a lot in my PhD about, about siblings. Um, 
that we're left behind. Um, and you're absolutely right. Yes, they are quite often marginalised. One of one of the findings actually from my work was that, um, and it is quite shocking that when the police come into the house and they come to in investigate what's happened, there is no very little provision made for the siblings that are in that house. Mm -hmm. um, and it it was really shocking to me that you know because this was a, this could be a secondary trauma. Um, where you know this has happened and then police come in and the house is taped off as a crime scene and the in almost every story that I listened to the parents told me about what they had to do with the other children so it was very much the parents who were in this situation thinking what are we going to do with so-and-so um, so I'd be you know I'd be really happy to talk to you about that um, and about the ways that I tried to simplify it I think I do I get asked to do training in the local authorities um, and people say to me can you can you come and do some training on death just give us give us give us an hour's training on death <laughs> and, and I always think well you know I, I always say to people that's like being asked to come and do an hour's training on life really you know and life's pretty complicated and actually so is death um, there's so many aspects to it and and once you start um, uh, you know, I'm picking those, it becomes more and more and more complicated. So mm. I think, you know, I'd be really happy to have a, a conversation with you, Donna, about what I did, if that's useful to you. Um, uh, but I think um, it is it is very complex. And, and the cultural mm -hmm. stuff, is, as you rightly say, is my colleague and I didn't really know, I think, what we were going to uncover in terms of the cultural um, stuff around death and social work um, mm. and now we do we know that we have to do something with it but we're still not sure what but it I think it very much fits into a lot of the um, the agenda around social justice and equality um, somehow yeah. in, in, the, in the way that we support people basically so sorry I can't give you a, give you a, a, a you know, an, an answer to that but I'd be really happy to have a conversation with you at some point if that's useful Oh, yes, no, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Denise. We have one from Andrew Lorimer in the in the uh, in the chat. By I was wondering if managers' ability—that's plural—to support workers through the deaths of a serv or the death of a service user is compromised by the fear of professional consequences. Yeah. This intersection of personal grief at the loss of a human being, yeah, uh, you may have uh, may have known well, and of course, professional grief, a fear of blame. Uh, maybe influencing the response. I guess you'd be familiar with that question, actually, in the sense of relationship to professional social work, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, Andrew. And I think, um, particularly in social work, the ways that probably the majority of the population, I, I would venture, are familiar with social work is through high-profile child deaths. So, you know, in social work. The death of children is the, is the absolute worst nightmare. And I know when I work with children, I used to have all sorts of strange dreams about that. So I think, you know, that again, it's a hugely enmeshed area. There is all sorts of fear. There's the fear of ending up in the papers, um, losing your job, all sorts of things. But then there is also, I would say, the, just the fear that is around death at all. So um, as I've said, I think we're still looking for ways to try and defeat that we don't I, I used to work in a hospice and um, at one time and I used to do obviously there was quite a lot of talk about death and people always used to say um, all of us are going to die and I used to think well you might but I'm not you know <laughs> um, because I think it's it's still one of the most difficult things for us it's to get our heads around so I think that there that's multi-layered Andrew as you will well know because I know you well um, but I, I think, yes, absolutely, professional consequences and the, the fear of failure are hugely, hugely tied up in that. Thank you. Uh, can, can, I, um, can I sort of uh, use Chair's uh, uh, privilege and ask you a question about the Northern Ireland research? Why do you think the Northern Ireland government came to you so quickly? I mean, I have a real sense that funerals there are massive. Uh, every colleague went to uh, every colleagues funeral for example even though they barely knew them at the university the place would close down for a funeral and I, of course it almost certainly emerges from the troubles mm. uh, but it's not but it's also it's interesting that both catholic and protestant funerals and you know that sort of public grief anyway seemed to me 
uh, through my the wrong end of a telescope to look the same in that respect. But do you think was there something that that really panicked this guy in Northern Ireland in respect of how it might affect communities, or was he really interested in the kind of grief at the personal, you know, um, family and you know more kind of interconnected level? I don't know. I think that's something I can give you a slightly more definitive um, answer to rather than just saying it's complex. <laughs> he it's was all interested... complex, definitely. <laughs> yeah, he was interested in both. Um, he wanted to, he's the chief social worker, so he very much wanted to um, put a marker in. You know, he wanted to say, I see you, if you know what I mean. I know that, that this is happening and, yeah. you know, and I want to, to make my mark and to, to acknowledge that I know that this is happening. So that was one aspect. He was also, um, I think there was, I don't know if, if I go as far as to say panic, but I think he was also really aware of not having um, their sort of Northern Irish cultural rituals um, subsumed by a sort of English narrative, if you like. And again, mm. you know, I realise I'm getting into very sort of um, simplistic generalisations, but for the sake of argument, please forgive me. Um, I, he was, he was, he wanted to um, keep the distinctiveness of their history and their culture, and so he wanted to make a marker by doing that. And, and as I said, that was very much reflected in some of the comments that we got. People were saying, well, why are we why are we suddenly talking about this here? We've never talked. We've never used these words before. Where are they coming from? You know, and I, I think that something like Johnson's speech actually is, is part of that. You know, many, mm. many families will lose loved ones. I think that that was a very shocking speech at the time. But he wasn't able to say lots of people will die. Mm. So. Um, you know, I think that's why Sean, Sean was, um, he, he wanted to say, as I've said, he wanted to say, he wanted to acknowledge it. Yeah. And he also wanted to keep the distinctiveness of it so it didn't become part of something bigger. It, it is an area, certainly post troubles of uh, a cross communal linkage where, uh, you know, it wasn't a case that Catholic colleagues went to Catholic funerals, definitely not quite the opposite, unless you were so hardcore on the Protestant side that you wouldn't step into a Catholic church, which actually, you know, would exist yes. in one small part of the community. It's very interesting. Yeah, I think it, 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 uh, it is a big thing there. I wondered if your Western model was really a Victorian model. Yes. So that's really, you know, black, black horses, black plumes. Morning know. jewelry. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think, I think we, you know, I and I think that there is still we are still quite influenced by that. So a lot of the more contemporary grief theories are American. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's interesting in itself because that's a whole other uh, conversation around culture, isn't it? But I think we are, I think you're right. Thank you for that. I think we are still quite dominated by um, the rituals that sprung up in Victorian times. And, you know, the, the results of the, you will know this better than me, Don, but the, you know, the silence around death partly comes from the, the world wars and particularly the Second World War, you know, and also the, the big epidemic of flu, actually, when there was just so much death that, that yeah. um, some of it was covered up, some of it was you know, propagandized. Um, it's all that keep calm and carry on. You know, we don't talk about death because it's partly it had become too difficult and partly it become too commonplace as well. I, I think it's actually, I mean, shouldn't have the line right here or whatever, I'll take up too much time. I don't think there's any other questions at the moment. Um, you know, quite simply, when your average age you know, of death was 50 something rather than the current 78 and 82, whatever it is for males and females, you actually saw more death in the past. Yeah. There was less resistance to it. There was less medicine against it. The likely working lives are more unhealthy. You had to deal with a lot more death, you know? one of those things yeah and i mean i think that's something i've just i've just written about this actually for for the the book that i was talking about on covid um that actually even at the moment i think death has still been quite medicalized actually it's the scientists that we've seen they've been the spokespeople um the scientists and the politicians we haven't hugely heard we we haven't really heard from social workers we haven't hugely heard from care workers Apart, you know, so it's it's I would argue that there's still being quite a medicalization um, of death. And of course, most of us haven't seen it. It's still been hived off into hospitals and things so that, you know, even though 
we've it's been brought into our living rooms in a way that we may not have experienced before it's still not a reality for a lot of people and it's still quite medicalized i think so yeah i was i was praying that the, the bells in the catholic chapel behind me would have stopped ringing by now but they hammer away in traditional <laughs> style and they're still going at it the entire time he was speaking the bells ringing out this is a part of southern germany where i am now where uh, women wear black sometimes up to a year for the death of their mother and right their father, not just for their uh, for their for their you know their partner which is kind of interesting uh, men don't seem to do it but anyway so right th that's not really is too self-indulgent of me listen we've reached our time that was really thank you really, really good really thought provoking really wide ranging great questions and some nice comments and so on as people have left Denise, thank you very much. It's great work, uh, great research. I look forward to seeing more fruits of it. Thank you very much. Thanks, and everybody, for joining everybody, in. And everybody, stay well. Look after yourself. Remember, we've got one more next week with, uh, with a, a, one of our colleagues from science.